<clears throat> hey everyone, this is Noemi, and I am here, home, and I've been starting to read the book of Jeremiah, and I feel that there's so much of God and why God does things here in, in these scriptures, and I mean, I've just, I've never really dove into this book and I am now and it's just so deep and so profound so I'm gonna be going over Jeremiah chapter 5 just reading and commenting because there's so much wealth of understanding as to why God does what he does and why he feels a certain way and how he compares himself you know, as, as like a husband, as a father, and the jealousy, and the, uh, the the vengeance, and the judgment. Like, it's so important that we know why God does what he does, especially when he um, passes judgment on a people. Now, this message is for Christians. If you're not a Christian, you know, in a way, this is message really a lot, I believe, is basically for people who take the name of the Lord in vain. And as a brief summary, taking the name of the Lord in vain basically means identifying yourself as a part of the Holy One's family. Like, we as Christians, if we say we are Christians... We are taking the name of Jesus Christ. Just like when t traditionally a woman gets married, she takes the last name of her husband. When we take Christian, Christ, disciple of Christ, Christian as a label and we do not represent the name or the family well, God takes it very personal. And so that is, in a nutshell, what taking the name of the Lord, taking the name of the Lord, taking the Lord's name in vain means. It's not a curse word like, oh, JD or, or GD or JC, you know, it is identifying yourself as a member of God's holy family and not representing what he commands of his people so this word is for believers it's not for people necessarily outside of god the knowledge of god outside the knowledge of scripture or who don't identify as his this is for god's people so here with that i'm gonna start <clears throat> i am reading from the niv just fyi okay Starting from verse 1, go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, look around and consider. Search through her squares. If you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this city. Although they say, as surely as the Lord lives, still they are swearing falsely. We see that today basically they're like oh i swear to god that i did this but they're lying oh i swear to god no i didn't do it and they think it's funny we here in america children do it all the time because they have no reverential fear of god they, they don't even know what they're saying in a way they have no implications so they will pinky swear and lie they will say i swear to god i didn't steal that mom and they did you know, um, so it's just, it, it, this is what that means. It's happening. Although they say, as surely as the Lord lives, still they are swearing falsely. People do that all the time today. Verse 3, O Lord, do not your eyes look for truth? You struck them, but they felt no pain. You crushed them, but they refused correction. They made their faces harder than stone and refuse to repent this verse uh, reminds me so i have you know family members and one of my nephews 
Um, you know, we would hear stories when he was very little that his mom would try to, like, you know, discipline him and slap him in the hand or spank him in the butt. And this child was just like, and what? That don't hurt. You know, and even till this day, sometimes kids do, whether because parents beat them a lot or whatever the reason is, um, or sometimes they're just stubborn. They're like, what? Or they're, they're stocky. You know, I had one, my older son was more stocky and muscular build where my little one was always very much more fragile, you know, flexible, fragile. So the physique can also be a part of the problem. But um, the idea is, is that God, you know, struck them, meaning he spanks us when we do wrong. And um, but they felt no pain. It's like, and what? You know, they didn't see or feel the consequences. They were calloused to it. Um, you crush them, but they refuse correction. How many people today in their arrogance and it's 100 percent, it's pride. They will refuse, even if they were wrong, they will refuse to break. They see it, we culturally, we see it as a sign of weakness. If we break and we're like, I'm sorry, I did wrong. That's humility. To Here in America, it's like, no, you don't say you're wrong. You know, like, it's just, no. You know what? Even if you're wrong, they will never know it. Like, and that's the mentality that this is um so you crush them but they refuse correction like you know they just became callous they made their faces harder than stone and refused to repent you know so many people in in the jail systems they were beaten, they were abused, and they hardened their face on purpose. Here in Britain, the street life, people hardened their face on purpose. Um, and they refused to repent because we're taught that if we show weakness, if we show sensitivity, um, that it it's bad for us like they're gonna eat us alive if we show any sign of weakness we can't do it so but that hardness keeps us from repenting from things that you know are hurting us so so then jeremiah goes i thought these are only the poor they are foolish for they do not know the way of the Lord. So here's Jeremiah he's trying to rationalize. Uh, yeah, but it's because of their upbringing. They're poor. They, they, they didn't have, they don't know. They don't know any better. So let's, that's kind of an excuse, right? Um, for they don't know the way of the Lord, the requirements of their God. So I will go to the leaders and speak to them. So now he's going to go to the leaders, the church leaders, the preachers. And speak to them. Surely they know the way of the Lord, the requirements of their God. But with one accord, they too had broken off the yoke and torn off the bonds. What this means is like Jeremiah went to these religious leaders and they're like, Surely these know, because man, their job is the word, right? And what he found is that with one accord, they had broken off the yoke. The yoke is like a, it's like a burden. It's like a thing that they carry. It's a responsibility. And he's basically saying that they refuse. They have let go or they have disassociated the responsibility to the Lord. Um, they also tore off the bonds. Um, there's a scripture verse that comes to mind about Paul saying that he's a bond slave of Christ. And what that is, is that as servants, we serve a Lord, we serve a master. That is a bond. In a way, it's a chain, but it, we chain ourselves 
out of our own free will. We chain ourselves to the master and we obey him. And these servants of God, they're supposed to be the, the religious leaders of their time. The leaders have basically disowned God, disowned their responsibility, and they've minimized the, the yoke. They're like, eh, you know, and it's, they've minimized it. And they've torn off the bonds, meaning like, yeah, that the word says that, but we don't have to live by it. Like, we don't have to live by it. The word says it, but we don't have to live by it. It's okay. We're good as we are. And we hear that message a lot today. Um, verse 6, therefore a lion from the forest will attack them. A wolf from the desert will ravage them. A leopard will lie in wait near their towns to tear to pieces any who venture out. For their rebellion is great and their backslidings many. And I think here... These are the things like God is in control of these animals. You know, they're, they're not microchipped, programmed, you know, robots. This is nature. And uh, definitely God is in control of nature. And he's basically putting enmity with nature on these people because of for their rebellion is great. And their backslidings many. So he's like, listen, you know, I've been long suffering, but this is just, that's it. You know, there's too much backsliding. How many times are you going to slap me in the face? You know, like this is just too much. So he allows nature to attack. Verse 7. Why should I forgive you? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by gods that are not gods. I supplied all their needs, yet they committed adultery and thronged to the houses of prostitutes. They are well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for another man's wife. Should I not punish them for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? So here, you know, God is saying, why should I forgive your children? Look at this. Why should, oh, well, he says, why should I forgive you? Your children have forsaken me. So he's talking like you didn't even raise your children in in the admonition of God. You didn't raise your children right. Why should I forgive you? Like you grown up who, you know, I delegated these children. I have blessed you. I have fed these, you and, and these children because God feeds us all, right? He supplied all their need. Yet they committed adultery and thronged to the houses of prostitutes. So these kids are just living reckless and wild. And God is like, why should I forgive you when this is what you produce? This is the fruit of your works is a bunch of rebellious, godless children. Why should I forgive you? Like, you know, look what you have done with what the the your stewardship has produced rotten fruit dysfunctional unholy fruit why should i forgive you've done horribly with what god has given you responsibility over so that is um that's god's logic he's like why why should i forgive you look at your children they, they commit adultery. They swear by other gods that aren't even real. They're like fake. They're not gods at all. And they're thronged to the houses of prostitutes. Like they just, they whore around. Hmm. They are well-fed, lusty stallions. Like I just, I see well-fed, bulky horses just strutting around. Each neighing for another man's wife. <laughs> like, just neighing. Like, 
this is all descriptive, just very like, I could see how men today are like that. How our youth today, they're just driven by hormones as it's, that's like their drive. Um, he goes, verse 9, should I not punish them for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this. This is, again, like, God takes all these offenses personal. He delegates children to his people. His people fail to raise them right, fail to train them up in the way that they should go. Their kids and the fruit of their work dishonors God their provider and God is like shouldn't I punish them for this like they all need to get spanked really bad like this is this is the work that I I blessed you to do no it's not it's far from it um verse 10 go through her vineyards and ravage them but do not destroy them completely strip off her branches for these people do not belong to the Lord. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have been utterly unfaithful to me, declares the Lord. Here's that unfaithful uh, paradigm of like husband and wife. The way God sees the marriage, right? Just like a wife takes the name of her husband Israel took on the name of God's people, like the living, the holy one of Israel, right? And so when they fail to represent this holy God, it is personal to God. You are offending his name. Like he gives you the option to enter into covenant with him. You know, he says this in my door is open. I, if you like what you see, you come and marry yourself to me. I will marry myself to you. And then when, when people enter into that agreement where they say, yes, I'm a Christian. And then they don't represent or they live as if God a holy God is not in their life. They are taking the name of the Lord in vain. It's offensive to God. How dare you come, call yourself my child, and not submit to my discipline? How dare you come into my house, live and uh, lavish yourself on all the goods of my provision, and you have no honor or reverence to the man of this house which is God who is holy and he wants his children and his people to be holy as he is holy like that is offensive like how dare you come to my house yes I open my door welcome come learn of me okay and we're I'm everything I have is yours and people come in and they're just like, oh, great, thank you. Thank you for this. And every time I want to talk and I want to share the word or I want to instruct them, they're like, shut up. I don't want to care. Oh, I don't care. Thank you for this. Oh, oh, you know, and they're just taking it. It's like it gets to a point where it's like, you know what? Get out. Okay. This is my house for people who can appreciate the one who runs this environment. You're not going to make my house a place of, of thieves and prostitutes when I value holiness. You're not even listening to me. You don't know my rules. You're not subject to my discipline. You harden your face when I'm here trying to love you. Get out. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and uh, the punishment. These are not my people. Get out. You know, verse 12. They have lied about the Lord. They said, he will do nothing. No harm will come to us. We will never see sword or famine. The prophets are but wind 
and the word is not in them, so let what they say be done to them. So look at this. They have lied about the Lord. They said he will do nothing. Family, Christians, if you identify as a Christian, I'm addressing you as family. There is a false, very misleading uh, gospel that says God is love and he doesn't punish. And because God is love, all he has to give is love. God is true love. But love does not encompass all of what he is. Like he's also justice. He's also wrath. Okay. Um, and he's holy. I think above love, he's holy. Um, his love is holy. And it's just so here there's a message coming out saying oh god's not gonna do nothing no harm will come to us we will never see sword or famine like oh things aren't gonna get bad the tribulation is gonna happen before everything gets really bad like um don't put all your chickens don't count your chickens before they hatch kind of thing um this is not the Lord. The Lord tests his people. And through trials and tribulation, he tests our foundation. What that means is if we have built our life, our morals, our character, our home, our families on the rock of his word, on the rock of biblical truth, then when the storms come, what we have built will survive. But when we have not built our life, our ministries, our businesses, our character, our reputation on the rock of truth, instead we have built it on shifting sand, like, oh, you know, telling stories here and there and, you know, doing stuff to impress, going beyond what you really are just to impress that's shifting sands and when the rocks and the the storms of life come and the trials that god allows to come nothing will be left standing and people are gonna be like oh why did god forsake us because they weren't they weren't built they weren't secure on a foundation that is truth that is biblical truth that is the word of jesus christ they built it on something else maybe on multiple preachers interpretations uh commentaries of other people good like it wasn't in them it wasn't their revelation it wasn't their conviction they didn't read the word for themselves and so that that is what happens um says the prophets so the, it is a lie when people say God will do nothing, God is most definitely going to do something here in America. And there are many people rising up <clears throat> to say, get ready, repent, get right with the Lord, church, because a work is, ha ha is happening. Revival is coming. Yes, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But it's going to come along with persecution. Okay, so it's going to be a simultaneous tribulation and revival because revival comes when persecution comes you know people tend to unify when there's persecution and it's really sad that it has to be that way but it's all throughout human history so god continued so verse 14 therefore this is what the lord god almighty says because the people have spoken these words, that's the words that, oh, God ain't going to do nothing. He's all love. There's no hell. Oh, no, he's just going to love you because you're just good. Stay the way you are. You're good. God loves you. Um, because they've lied about God. Uh, I will make my words in your mouth a fire and these people the wood it consumes. And it talks about Revelation, about the two prophets 
and how fire came out of their mouth. And there is a fire or like a, a burning consequence that people feel when they are not living right with God. When they are not living right with God and someone says, repent because God says this is wrong, it, it burns them, it hurts them, and it, 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 it's either going to consume you or refine you. And hopefully you're made more of wood, you know, there's gold in you, you're a diamond in the rough, maybe you're just living wrong because you haven't heard this message, but it says that the, the gospel is a fragrance to, of life to those who are being saved and a fragrance of death to those who are inheriting judgment. And so there's this double-edged sword, the word, aka the word, this double-edged effect that the word can, can either motivate you to, to get right with God if you're humble enough or if you're proud and just too defensive and too um, arrogant, it's going to offend you and burn you and you're going to reject it. You're going to be offended by the word. Um, and it will it will judge you. <laughs> so, um, O house of Israel, this is verse 15. O house of Israel, declares the Lord, I am bringing a distant nation against you, an ancient and enduring nation, a people whose language you do not know, whose speech you do not understand. Their quivers are like an open grave. All of them are mighty warriors. They will devour your harvest and food, devour your sons and daughters. They will devour your flocks and herds, devour your vines and fig trees. With the sword, they will destroy the fortified cities in which you trust. Yet even in those days, declares the Lord. So he's saying, look, this nation, they're going to beat you up so bad because you guys are just so disrespectful of my home that land was god's home god's chosen home for his people for his children for his family for his bride and they just disrespected god's home so he's bringing all these people gonna destroy and then but even despite all this destruction there's a word of hope yet even in those days declares the lord I will not destroy you completely. And when the people ask, why has the Lord our God done all this to us? You will tell them, as you have forsaken me and serve foreign gods in your own land, so now you will serve foreign gods in a land not your own. So this is the judgment of God, which is very fair. He's like, all right. You took possession of all my blessings and you trampled on it. You prostituted yourself all over my holy sanctuary and home. You, you know, and what happens when, when trials and tribulation come, when disaster strikes, hurricanes, tsunamis, what do people say? Oh my God. Why? Why are you do why is this happening? Right? There's there's like this understanding that when these massive epic disasters come that there is a god responsible for it. <laughs> and it's like, listen, there's a god responsible for it, but why is he is he only respond like he is he is responsible of so much more like he's he wants to be involved in your everyday life. Um, and, but only when these big things, natural disasters come, people are like, where are you, God? Where is this God? Why is he not protecting us? And then God's answer is, the same way you have forsake me, my home, you, you completely ignored me for, for that, for gods that are not gods. All right. I'm going to send you over there so you can serve their gods in a land that's not your own. Because this was your home. 
and you've desecrated it to such a level because you want other gods. So I'm going to give you over to other gods, their people, stuff that doesn't even belong to you because that's what you want. That's what you want. That's what you're going to get. There you go. I'm handing you over. Verse 20. Announce this to the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah. Hear this, you foolish and senseless people who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Should you not tremble in my presence? I made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier it cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say to themselves, let us Fear the Lord our God, who gives autumn and spring rains in season, who assures us of the regular weeks of harvest. So there's so much here. You know, God is like, listen, these people are foolish and senseless. Here in America, foolish is almost like a curse word. You just, you hurt somebody's ego and it's just hate speech <laughs> i'm so sorry but it's so true and god's like listen you, you're acting the fool we do sometimes i act the fool i admit i admit you know and we just it's okay like it's part of human nature it happens to the best of us like it really does so Okay, he's like, you foolish and senseless people. We have eyes, but we're not really seeing. We're not seeing what really matters. We have ears, but we're not really hearing what's important. Um, should you not fear me, declares the Lord. He's like, uh, don't you know? Like, I could destroy you. I know we've had parents in the Hispanic culture. It's like, listen, boy, girl. I made you, I could take you, I could destroy you, you know, things like that, or that mentality. Well, God actually has that power, like, he could take our breath whenever he wants. Um, our breath, it, it doesn't even belong to us, yet we need it to live. And um, he's like, should you not tremble before my presence? There's this christian gospel that god is so loving that we don't even know that he it's like consider the greatness and severity of god every time a prophet like came before the lord or had a vision what did they do they like drop to the floor and they're like whoa is me i am undone for i've seen god or you know i've seen the throne and it's just like uh, you know, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips who lives among a people of, with unclean lips. Like, woe is me, I curse every now and then, you know, and I live among a people who swear all the time. They curse, they, they're they vulgar. Like, whoa, like that makes us unclean because we think it's so natural, that it's so common, that it's okay. It's not in front of a holy God. There used to be a time when, before all the scandals of, you know, the Catholic Church and all the pedophile priests, um, where people had a reverential, you know, respect over the priesthood. It was like, oh my goodness, you know, and they considered a priest like a holy person and you could be talking with friends like, ah, oh, but then somebody holy comes and it's like, you know, no, shh, don't, don't talk like that, you know, like respect or, shh, you know, don't. And nowadays, the, the narrative is like, listen, this is how I talk and I, you can just like it or go away. And that's just pure arrogance. Like we're called to have respect, like I demand respect. I don't like swearing. Um, 
you know, I used to curse worse than a sailor. I had a father that cursed really bad and God cleaned my mouth. Hallelujah. And and I don't like to be around it. And I will tell people, listen, you know, tone it down. Can you stop swearing? Can you tone it down? Because I can't deal with it too much. It's offensive. It hurts my spirit to be around such negativity. Curse words. Curse. They pollute the air. They pollute the environment. And they afflict the spirits of all who hear. That's why they are curse words. Just a little food for thought there. So... Oh, yeah, and so God is like, he's worthy to be feared. He's worthy to tremble in his presence like the work of his hand has made a boundary between the roaring ocean and the coast. You know, uh, like that is the mighty hand of God that does that. And it's it's very, it should be very impressive. Like, okay, a hand that holds the coastline in place should I not fear that? You know, like, yeah, I should. Absolutely. And fear of the Lord is just the beginning of wisdom. It's not the fullness. It's just the beginning. But without the fear, you're prone to completely not understand God at all. Um, so, okay. They say... They do... They they do not say to themselves let us fear the lord our god who gives autumn and spring rains in season and assures us of the regular weekly harvest here in america i think it's hard for us because we're such a commercial industrialized nation you know we don't see how god provides the harvest and we don't really understand how the seasons matter in a harvest unless we're like farmers most of us here in america live in cities we buy our food in grocery stores there's an abundance we don't understand that when there's not a healthy season and like 90 percent of our food here in america is genetically enhanced it's not even natural I wonder if even the nutritional value is the same as the real thing. Um, uh, that's a whole nother conspiracy. But the idea is that we, we're not conscious that rain and seasons cater to these provisions, which were so essential. So it's a little harder for us here in America. And I, I understand, like, I'm born and raised, made in America, you know. Um, so I think these things work against us, not for us, is what I'm saying. And I just want to make a note of that, that. Back in this time, when this was written, there weren't grocery stores that had an abundant stock that could feed an entire city. You know, um, it was scarce. It was dependent on seasons. And it, we, they didn't have refrigeration where they could store their food for weeks and months and things like that. So, verse 25, your wrongdoings have kept these away. Your sins have deprived you of good. <clears throat> so, when God starts withholding seasons and prosperity many times it's because our sins uh are causing god to to lift his hand of blessing and provision it's like eh, i don't know this is an ungrateful child they're not listening to me um verse 26 among my people are wicked men who lie in wait like men who snare birds and like those who set traps to catch men. So <clears throat> this is about the hypocrisy of people. God is saying that among his people, and this is food for thought for you to consider, that are there um, among those in your church, okay, among those in your families, <clears throat> 
who go to church or someone you know that goes to any church, are there men or women who lie in wait like they they have they set a trap like you know i'm gonna set this person up i'm gonna set this person up you know they did something bad to my niece so i'm gonna set them up watch watch and learn right you hear that that's a lot of like street talk that's what that means when they lie in wait like men who snare birds and like those who set trap to catch men that's what that means you're lying and you're waiting to catch somebody. You're waiting to set a trap for somebody when you want to repay, you know, evil for evil. Like, it's like, oh, you see what this person did? <laughs> Watch. Wait and see. I I'm going to be talking to some people. I'm going to set this guy up. Watch. He thought that was funny. That wasn't funny. I'm going to set him up. Watch. This is like common stuff. You know people who say things like that and they go to church. This is bad. This is bad. Um, why are they going to church? What's their objective? Are they being forced to go to church because they're just rebellious teenagers? Or if they're adults, uh, be very leer. Like, stay away from these people. I would disassociate from all of that. Like, uh, hmm. There's something wrong with your heart because that in scripture is an evil person, a wicked person. Um, verse 27, like cages full of birds, their houses are full of deceit. They have become rich and powerful and have grown fat and sleek. Their evil deeds have no limit. They do not plead the case of the fatherless to win it. They do not defend the rights of the poor. Should I not punish them for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? He's talking about the nation should be punished because these people are in their midst. They're unchecked. Um, there's a, a situation... Uh, right now, like in Connecticut, that has been happening since 2017. Um, an elderly disabled man was abused by 10 state employees in a hospital. He was disabled. He was mentally disabled. He was abused. This is the Whiting case, Whiting Forensic Hospital case. And I followed the situation one of the guys who actually did really horrendous abuses including you know rubbing his crotch on the disabled person's face and just horrible stuff uh all caught on video and then leaked to the press and the public and this guy was a member of a congregational church and his church and the pastor and his family all showed up one day to this to one of his court you know vouching that this person is such a good person he's a good father he's this he's a member of the community and all this yet this mer person was caught on videotape doing horrendous abuses to a fatherless a, a, you know, individual, an elderly, uh, mentally disabled individual. And how can this church not feel an ounce of, like, yes, God can restore us and he calls us to repent, but has there been repentance? Like, they were basically standing on the fact that this person is good. None of what you're saying is could be true or or somehow minimize the abuse caught on video. It was horrible. And God says, these people, like, if someone is capable of that much evil to such a vulnerable adult, what he has a lot more in his closet than just that. That person is sick. That person is mischievous in very um, deviant, uh, malign ways. 
And there's more to him than this picture that this church tried to paint. And God is saying, should I not avenge myself? This guy represents you. This guy represents your church. You want to be associated with that guy? You Does that guy represent what your church is about? That's the people you harbor. People who do harm. People who uh, abuse elderly and vulnerable adults. Like... Is that, should should God not avenge his name, right? And his home and, and correct such things? Um, avenge himself, his name, on, on such people that are allowing such atrocities to run unchecked in their ch church churches? So, um... Verse 30, and this is wrapping up the chapter. A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. This is horrible and shocking. The prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority. And my people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? This is... This is the horrible and shocking thing. Like, prophets are prophesying lies. The priests and the authorities, they rule just because they have the power, you know, to show mercy where they want. They're godless themselves. They don't have an authority over them. They are the law in their own mind. Um, and my people love it this way. The church is content the church christians are okay with this they they're not fighting it they're not they're just content they're okay that's just the way things are but what will you do in the end in the end we're gonna reap all this the sleeping church has to wake up to the fact that we are called to make a difference in this nation. We are called to make a difference in the people around us. We are called to represent a father who is holy and blesses his children. But he also raises us up like he disciplines his children. Um, we're called to represent a provider who, you know, is good, like we see blessings abound my cup overflows because i serve the lord but i also know that he is worthy to be feared and any deviation is offensive and i don't want to offend a holy god i don't want to offend an all-consuming fire i don't want to play with an all-consuming fire and pretend or delude my mind that you know here's a bonfire i'm just gonna sprinkle gasoline all over myself and see if i could jump higher than the bonfire and not catch on fire like that's just foolishness and it's senselessness um there are people who do that type of stuff and they're fools and crazy and they're risking their life and they know it but they don't care um do you want to be that person? Like, no, I don't. I don't want to be that person. I want to reverence the life I've been given. And I want to honor the Father who has given me life. And who has given me this life and this ministry and my call. And who has saved me from <sighs> countless things. And he's given me dignity. And he's given me purpose. And my cup overflows. And this nation needs to wake up. Family, you need to wake up. God is a God, is first God. Like, you know, and he wants children who love him. He wants a people and a bride who want him. Not his salvation without him. And that's offensive. If, if I were to get married to somebody, okay, and he's a multi-billionaire, right? 
Um, it would be offensive if I'm just like, I'm just going to get married for him for his money. Oh, yeah, I'm going to suck up. Like, oh, yeah, in front of his face. But really, I could care less what he's about. God sees through your heart. His desire is for a bride who loves what he loves and is willing to hate what he hates, you know, for themselves, for themselves. We're called to take out the plank out of our own eye before we can even consider taking out the speck on someone else's. This is a message to believers, for us believers to wake up to take our position and to get right with God. He is holy, he is worthy to be feared, but he is rich and abounding with love, mercy, grace, and blessings to those who fear him, meaning those who don't want to offend him. You know, so this is, this is the message for today. Um, I've been spending a lot of time in Jeremiah. It's pretty serious. But I hope this message helps you understand why God does it. Like, we would do it if it was done to us. If we opened our home to people with a desire for relationship, for fellowship, and they despise us they just took what we had and despised the person who was opening their home like we would kick them out like get out of here you ungrateful spiteful person you know like get out and god is the same and so and he will you know judgment comes to the house of god first why because we're taking the name of the Lord in vain if we are not representing the holy God of Jesus Christ. So, who for thought? Blessings, fam.